Welcome to Trail Tales ARP, a running podcast for every type of runner, with Sean Soban and Russell the Runner. Okay, so Fat Dog in 2016. Um, yeah, so that one I wasn't as trained as I would have liked to have been, which tend to happen a little with a lot of races around the last few years, I think. But just busy with work and stuff. Um, I've been I work at the time I'm self employed and work from home now, which is much easier to find time to run for, but I worked uh, downtown Toronto for 20 years, taking the train down and trying to find time to run on lunches and things. So yeah, between that and kids and stuff. Anyway, I wasn't as trained as I would like to have been, but uh, I really wanted to do fat dogs. So I went out and uh, gave it my go and uh, yeah, it's beautiful scenery um, near the end of the race. Some of the best scenery is in the dark, which is too bad. There's a big uh, skyline Ridge at the end that I wanted to see, but but uh, it was a bit daunting being 120 miles, and I just take it aid station by aid station, try not to think about the distance. But one mental trick I did at that race is I absolutely convinced myself that it was a 100-mile race, not 120, because there's the aid station at mile 99, and right after that, you climb, I think it's about 4,500 feet straight up right after that 99-mile aid station. So yes, I the skyline's myself. incredibly steep. Yes, it was. And so I, I honestly talked myself into thinking that mile 99 80 station is the finish line when i get there i'll worry about the next 20 miles and so i did so i mean i always take it one eight station at a time anyway so it didn't really affect things overall but yeah and by the time i got there then i still had 20 miles to go and a huge climb so it's pretty evil of them to put that climb right at the end but uh it took a while but yeah so uh really enjoyed that race though so that took oh good lord 43 hours i finished that one in and so that's that's nonstop, no sleep. And I that's one thing I wasn't sure about. And I really, one of the reasons I wanted to do it because it's that long, I was curious whether I'd be able to go that long without sleeping, how I'd feel. And uh, yeah, I ended up doing the whole thing without sleeping and then napped after that before I, I had some relatives in uh, Kelowna. So I had to drive there after. So took a nice long nap first and then drove back to Kelowna after. But yeah, really enjoyed that race. That was great. And uh, I might go back and do that one eventually. It's still the only hard rock qualifier in Canada. Um, Western Alpine Meadows was uh, last year for one year. And then we got that email just last week or earlier this week that it uh, is no more, unfortunately. I really wanted to do Western uh, Alpine Meadows, Whistler Alpine Meadows, sorry, but uh, too bad. So so I might go back and do Fat Dog again uh, in the future. We'll see. But uh, so that was 2016 and then 2017, oh, 2017. What I did in 2017, uh, again, with work, even worse, I signed up for Leadville again. I thought five years later, let me go back and get this done. And that chart I was talking about where I track all my 100 mile races, that was the least I'd ever trained for a race. I was just way too busy with work and commitments and I shouldn't have gone. And I went anyway, and uh, I'd already paid for the flight, hotel, everything was planned. I thought, let me just go. But my rationale was I, I knew the course because I'd been there before. I got five years more experience than the last time I was there. And this time I'm going to bring poles. I didn't have poles last time. So I thought, I know I'm not trained for this, but I should be able to, you know, just get it done. And uh, that became evident pretty early on that I wasn't going to. So by the time I got to going up an Overhope Pass, um, I did the math wrong. I remember sitting down, taking in the view, having something to eat, and then looking at the math and realizing, wait a minute, I might not make the next cutoff. And yeah, by the time I got to Winfield, 50 miles, I'd missed the cutoff by two minutes. But I was having a rough time. I was not trained at all. I should not have gone. So that was silly of me. Um, so that was two DNFs at Leadville. And uh, but to miss the cutoff by two minutes, that's yeah, incredibly heartbreaking. It's it was. I don't know. Had I made that cutoff, then that would have just made the next bunch just as hard, right? So Yes, in which... Truthfully, we all know that 100 mile journeys are not twice as hard as 50 miles. They're <laughs> no. at least eight times harder. So. There's a lot of different aspects between the the yeah sleep management and the nutrition is different. Everything definitely, so, yeah. absolutely, with regards to nutrition and sleep yeah. deprivation and all of those factors. So, but I mean, I want to go back with regards to fat dog. Yeah, essentially, you were awake because before the race, uh, before that grand adventure and after i mean you you were awake for over two days yeah it was about i think it came to 50 hours before i finally got my nap in yes because you're you're in this adventure for 43 hours yeah. and then you've got before and after so i mean 
tell us about that. I mean, clearly it was beautiful scenery and the yeah. entire adventure was incredible. And you journeyed 120 miles with nearly the elevation of Everest, which is beyond. Phenomenal. It was actually that year. But so um, how was, how was you... the sleep after that? I mean, we're. <laughs> oh, I slept great after. Well, <laughs> but the, the course that year, this keeps happening to me. There's always something that goes wrong with these races um near the one of the climbs called heather they had to redirect yes, the, the heather to trail get the reason why uh so they added uh two and a half miles so it was the fat dog 122.5 that year something like that seems to happen so essentially time. 200 kilometers <laughs> yeah 197 technically yes but i, but, I mean but to- let's make it 200 because you know, walk up. to the bus and then you know exactly like that my, my hotel <laughs> wasn't the hotel i booked and so yeah, everyone stays in, uh, what's the name of that little town where the hotels are? I can't remember now. The shuttle picks Manning you up. In Park? Town. Not, it's not in Manning Park. There's another town where the uh, where the shuttles pick everyone up. Anyway, there's a few hotels there. And so when I got there to this little town there's, with no options, I get to the front desk and they don't have my reservation. And so I, I printed it out. I showed it to them and the guy was so apologetic. And uh, it was part of a chain, but but that hotel was family owned and the guy was so nice about it. They had no rooms for him. And uh, so That's he called around terrifying. and other hotels and he found another one on the edge of town, some uh, little motel. I didn't care where I stayed. And so he drove me there. And then but I said, uh, you know, now I'm out here at this hotel just outside of town, basically. I was planning staying in town where there's restaurants and everything I got to eat. So he offered to drive me back to the restaurants later and stuff. I said, no, I just walked it. I think it was like a kilometer and a half away. And so, yeah, that was a bit worrying because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do if there was no hotel. But uh, anyway, so when you add in the walk to and from the hotel to the shuttles the next day, then, yeah, it comes up more like 200 kilometers. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I was a bit surprised that I managed to stay awake. There were times when I was nodding off. That, and that happens in the middle of the night sometimes. And you start to nod off on the trail a bit and then you get your second wind and, and keep going. But uh yeah, after the race was, uh, I, I was going to drive. I had to drive from the finish line to where the showers were, which is still in Manning Park. And even by then, I could tell, like, I wasn't falling asleep, but you start hallucinating and things. The trees were moving a bit funny on the side of the road. And I thought I shouldn't be driving now. So I uh, took a nap uh, after a shower and then drove back to my aunt and uncle, stopped on the way to take another nap and then slept good when I got there. But yeah, I was really curious, to be honest, how the sleep deprivation would go uh, over two nights like that. And it worked out. I'm not sure how, because I've done, like you saw Halliburton last year, where I fell asleep after a few hours. <laughs> and I've done this, and there's a few other races where I've had to stay up for two nights. So I don't know how I did it, but uh, yeah, you just uh, keep going. There, I was running with a guy when we got to the mile 99 day station. He was done. He he wanted to take a nap, which is probably good for you. I could have stopped, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes taking a power nap. If I had to, I would have, but I was okay. I got to the end and it seemed to work out. So it's uh it's it's funny how the, the mind and body work when you get that exhausted. <laughs> Definitely. And every experience is different, of course. And so based on that, I mean it's interesting how one night events could at times be more challenging than a two full day push. It's yeah. sometimes there's circumstances within our control and sometimes there's not, obviously. I mean, clearly sometimes there's a baby crying in the next room all night. That's what happened to Halliburton. <laughs> so that's, you that's never know the experience. <laughs> yeah. that's, so, I mean, overall, with all of your different ultra marathon experiences, I mean, clearly the mantra never quit is most powerful. Morgan, sure. but yeah. what would what specific traits would you recommend to ultra runners who are looking to develop and become more ingrained in the sport i mean clearly persistence is important would there be any other traits that you would emphasize in terms of people growing in ultra running just do it get out of your comfort zone and do it it's you can do more than you think you can and i don't want to say they're I wouldn't say they're easier than I expected, but like doing a hundred miles, it's, it's just about not stopping and, and you just got to keep going. You're going to, things are going to hurt. You're going to feel pain. There's, every race has adversity. Uh, we haven't gone through them all, but there, I've had other ones where I've had injuries during the race and, you know, you just got to keep going. So advice I would give is, is that, and that's what you always hear is just keep grinding, keep going. Don't stop. Everyone has a different motivation. Maybe you've got runners that motivate you. You follow runners to, uh, 
motivate you, things like that. You know, there's always Goggins and people who motivate people uh, to do things that they wouldn't normally do. But, and uh, it was for me too. Funny about that. I was, when I was just getting into running and then I had uh, above my desk at home, I had these five, five pictures I put up of things that inspired me and, and they were all like inspirational pictures. Anyway, the five of them I had, this is in 2008. I had a picture of Superman. I had Rocky running up the stairs. I had Muhammad Ali with uh, uh, Joe Frazier lying in front of him. That There's that iconic pose he does. And then I had a picture of Dean Karnazes running across the Gobi Desert. And the fifth one in 2008 was of David Goggins of when he finished Badwater. And that's actually the picture he has on the cover of his latest book. So that was before social media and all the hype and everyone getting sick of him and everything else. And uh, I, I found his story fascinating back then about how he grinded through 100, eating crackers on broken feet and got into it and really inspiring. And so he was an inspiration for me way back in 2008. <laughs> so uh, if you find people like that that motivate you and then uh, that you follow along, then absolutely, whatever works for you. Most definitely. David Goggins' books, Can't Hurt Me and Never Finished. I've, yeah. I've had to read them. I've, I've been meaning to buy them, but they're incredibly inspiring books. Have you had the chance to read? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of, of the second one. I read the Can't Hurt Me after it came out. And then uh, his latest one, I'm uh, about a quarter of the way through it right now. And uh, my wife got it for me for Christmas. So um, yeah, they're great, inspiring books. There's a lot of running books. You know, Everyone's read probably Born to Run, who's into ultras and stuff, which... You know, everyone kind of makes jokes about it now, but geez, some of those are inspiring stories. Scott Jurek's book, Eat and Run, that's got some really cool stories about each of his 100 milers and his races and Spartathlons and things along there. So uh, those are all inspiring books and stuff. But in the end, it's, it's you got to inspire yourself. You can only, you know, live off other people doing things so much. It's like reading race reports and things. Sometimes I'll read some that are kind of inspiring. And then you get near the end. Somebody talked about how they had issues and were throwing up or something. I was reading this one where the guy threw up, had all sorts of issues. And then you get to the end. So I grinded through and finished in 18 hours in third place. I can't relate to that. I want to hear about the people who are normal runners who want to push through. This guy's talking about how tough things are. And then at the end, he's, uh, you know, one of the top finishers. That's sometimes those can be hard to relate to. I want to hear real stories about people grinding through things. Definitely. So, I, I find that the longer, the people who don't have the genetic abilities or the or the skill or the talent to run a hundred miles in a specific time, yeah. it's I I find that the people who don't have those skills and abilities, uh, genetically and in terms of performance wise, are far more impressive because they're regular Absolutely. human beings who are pushing their limits and, um you know, that's incredibly more inspiring, especially given how much longer they're on their feet for in the sport. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they're not gifted at all. Yeah. And uh -huh. they, they literally apply the characteristics of persistence, patience, dedication, and never give up attitude. And that's how they Absolutely. find themselves on the other side of whether it be 25 or 30 or 35 hours later, a 100 mile of adventure. And, that's incredible. Um, but with that being said, I mean, the, the people who are gifted are gifted and, oh, you know, and a lot of them acknowledge everyone that. is different. And yeah, I mean, there, there is something to be appreciated from those people who are gifted, who, you know, For the sure. Jim Walmsley's of the world who run Western States in 14 some hours. I mean, it is, it is incredible. There's but, a little genetics there, but yeah, obviously the, you got to train hard and master your skills to do that. But uh, I won't yes. be doing that in 14 hours anytime soon. Definitely. But, it's, I uh, mean, a lot of these guys acknowledge that though. A lot of the race winners and stuff, they'll come out and watch the, the, the golden hour, the people finishing at the end. Cause they know how hard those people are pushing. Yes. You know, somebody might finish a race near the, in the podium and they gave 90%. Somebody else has given a hundred percent and they're coming in in 29 and a half hours. Like, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Courtney DeWalter, who's my favorite ultra runner personally, she yeah. finished the Tahoe 200 in six minutes shy of 50 hours. And two days later, she's clapping people in. Yeah. Because exactly. it's not about the time. It's about you. Everyone covered the same distance and that couldn't be more special. And yeah. in many ways, the people who were out there for four days are far more 
I mean, it's, 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 that's what makes ultra running special. It's, I mean, everyone's on a level playing field in terms of you're all trying to achieve the same distance and the same goal. And it's, it's much different from any other sport. And that's, that's what makes it special. Uh, The camaraderie and the support and whether you're on your feet for one day or two days or four days, it's, it's it that's what makes the sport beautiful oh, you're all doing it together it doesn't feel like you're competing against each other unless there's someone no. on your heels maybe but it, it feels more like you're all you're all doing it together you meet people especially in the hundreds it's more of an adventure you're meeting people along the way you're running together for portions of it helping each other out you know it's uh, it's different than most sports where uh, everyone's against each other definitely so a community yeah absolutely in which yeah i mean that's what makes the sport just more unique and and special than any other sport from my perspective. So I want to ask Morgan, so what are your plans for ultra marathons this year? Have you signed up for any events yet? And, and, and I know like, so most of your 50 ultras are events, but I mean, how often do you enjoy running ultras just out on your own? Um, Probably not too often. I've done a few, a few training runs that would, I guess, so to qualify as an ultra anything over a marathon distance. So sometimes, yeah, like when I was getting ready for hurt running in the snow for 60 kilometers, that was brutal. And then I've done a few others, just gone out on a run once, got carried away and came back home 62K later. Um, Not too often. A few of that me and a buddy were kind of planning. We keep putting off, but uh, there's some trails in Ontario, um, the Western Uplands Trail in uh, West Algonquin. End of Algonquin. There's a yes. few trails there. You can make your own loops up to like 90K. So we've been looking at those. Yes. And then um like cloche silhouettes up in uh killarney there's an 80k yes. loop i've been looking Killarney at is incredibly too. challenging i've yet yeah, to do I've, it but i've, I've seen, seen a few through. friends i've seen a few videos of it too and so that's always been on the list and then uh we'll see how soon i get to that and there's a couple sections of bruce trail that i was looking at where i'm gonna go uh park my car run 50 and then have my wife pick me up at the other end so but uh no no real epic uh epic uh events or anything that i've been thinking of outside of ultras outside of actual races uh as for races this year so i got back into western finally after i don't know how many times applying and so that's actually going to be 10 years from the last time i did it so that's kind of i cool. couldn't be more exciting and yeah, in which i saw uh, i had seen that on your facebook and yeah, yeah. it's I, I couldn't be more excited for you morgan i mean especially to return a decade later that's incredibly yeah. special well, I'm excited that I get to do it, and I'm excited that I don't have to keep looking for a Western qualifier every year because you got to uh, keep applying. At least during COVID, they did change the rule finally, where it used to be you had to apply for Hard Rock and for Western consecutive years. If you missed a year, your chances go back to zero. Uh, they changed that rule, so now you can miss a year, whatever you want, and your historical uh, uh, entries still qualify remain the same so, thank which goodness. i'm incredibly grateful they kept that the same because that's yeah. that, that didn't seem fair the way they used to have it i mean they shouldn't be removing credits or or yeah, yeah just tickets People were jumping into races and uh the, i remember one of the years i did i did grindstone um in virginia and pretty much didn't want to do it again and then the following year um my qualifier was going to be eastern states in uh pennsylvania and they canceled the Eastern States. That was 2018, um, about two months prior. I can't, some silly reason, something about the ham radio operator not being available or something. I don't know what the real reason was, but anyway, they uh, canceled it. And so I had to find another Western qualifier because that was back when it was still consecutive years. And so I wound up doing Grindstone a second time. I did it the 2018 again, which didn't really want to go back and do it. I prefer once I've done a race, unless I really loved it, you know, there's only so many years to do these and i generally do 100 only once a year so i'm uh there's only so many races i'm going to do anyway so i had to go back my point is and cram it in because i needed a western qualifier before the year ended uh, before november actually and so i'm glad they got rid of that rule at least and so i'm looking forward to not having to constantly find western qualifiers going forward because now that i'm going back a second time unless it's a disaster then that'll probably be it i don't think i'm going to keep applying for it I can focus on eventually getting into hard rock uh, after my eight denials. Yes. I was actually going to ask that next. So, I mean, clearly, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating that you're finally going back to Western States after 10 years, you've tried to get into hard rock eight different times. 
I'm sure it's just a matter of time. I mean, despite, <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, that's incredibly difficult to digest, of it's course. Probably, that I made it to 10th on the wait list once, but uh, I mean, that, that's the closest I got. So it's an and incredibly honestly, popular and substantial event. Obviously, it's, you know, Courtney DeWalter finishing in first in that event. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's clearly a, 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 a she significant had, event in the ultra yeah. running world. Oh, I remember that she had issues the year before. Um, uh, yes, some issues I think, and then went back the next year and set the course record. So, yes, so we'll see. But again, that's a race I don't even know if I could do. It's uh, with the altitude and uh, those massive climbs and stuff. So, so that's the kind of race that I want to do where I'm challenging myself. So, definitely, and which that's always the goal, as we know. And it's, I mean, clearly you've challenged yourself throughout your entire life journey of ultra marathoning, Morgan, and it's it I, I couldn't be more inspired by your journey and I, many many people i i'm sure that will that will listen to this episode will be equally inspired that to to my inspiration from you it's it's i mean all of the journeys that you've been on it's uh, it, it's it's truly remarkable and uh, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast <laughs> Nice chatting with you. Know it's been nice sharing some of this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of runners that uh, you can meet at all these races who've done tons of these who can inspire you, and uh, it's always nice to hear people's stories. So, yeah, thanks for having me on. It's been great, uh, great chatting with you, Russ. Definitely. And so we typically end these sessions by with our Trail Tales ARP saying, and that is "Run wild." <laughs> All right. I go with get lost on my videos, but uh, we'll go with run wild. For this one. <laughs> that works well too. And so, okay. Until next time, trail tales, ARP family, it's Russell, the runner and Morgan Schick signing off. <laughs> All right. Thanks Russ. Run wild. Run wild. <laughs>